Hello, my name is Terry Stewart, and this is the first lecture in a series for Nengo and the Neural Engineering Framework. Um, what are we going to be doing here? We are going to be talking about how in the world you can get neurons to build large-scale systems, to be the components in large-scale systems that we're going to build. Um, and the goal of this series is to get things up to the point um, where you can understand the techniques used to build Spawn, which is the video that you're seeing there on the left, um, which is the world's largest functional brain simulation, two and a half million spiking neurons organized in about 20 different brain areas, um, and it's capable of doing very simple tasks like the one that you're just seeing there where it was shown a sequence of digits and it is trying to repeat them back, to remember them and repeat them back out. So that's where we want to get to. Okay, so um, the work that I'm going to be talking about um, is, def is a large group effort. Um, it's out of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. Um, I was a uh, postdoc there for 10 years working under Chris Eliasmith. Chris Eliasmith is the uh, this you know, person in the center middle there, uh, or center top. Um, and it's uh, his general framework that we're going to be talking about. Um, on the left are a lot of the uh, PhD students and master's students uh, whose work will be talked about, um, and then on the right are previous PhD students and master's students from the lab um, who have then gone off and started a company, uh, Applied Brain Research, um, and um, I was also Chris and I were also co-founders of that company. Um, and uh, they're attempting to see um, what sorts of commercial applications and also continue to develop the software that we're going to be using uh, throughout this. All right, so that's, so yeah, as I said, I spent 10 years as a postdoc in that lab. Um, and in the last year, um, I've now a National Research Council uh, employee. So I'm a research officer at the National Research Council of Canada. It's a government research lab um, with about 1,000 full-time researchers um, spread across Canada. I'm at the new University of Waterloo Collaboration Centre. So basically they hired me to stay at Waterloo and continue doing exactly what I was doing before, um, which is really quite exciting. I'm feeling very lucky about that. So, um, what is this that I'm doing? Um, my overall goal is I want to understand the mind. Um, I want to understand what the algorithms are underlying cognition. I want to know what the mind is doing. Um, and I want to be able to sort of test ideas about um, what the mind is doing. And... Um, because it's, it's one thing to you know, come up with stories about how the mind is doing, how can we actually know what's going on there? Um, and the techniques that I got trained in and that I started with, um, and that I'm still sticking with, um, uh, because, well, I started as an engineer, my undergrad is in, engin is in engineering, and that sort of came along a little bit as I uh, got into this process. Um, and I find myself very attracted to this idea of you're building computer models of the mind, and in particular, we're building mechanistic models of the mind. Um, so what do we mean by mechanistic models? Um, the internal components of these models uh, should map onto the real system. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's not just an arbitrary model that just happens to produce the same behavior as people. Um, what I really want is a model where um, there's something about the internals of that model that map onto the real system. Um, and the only reason these things end up being computational models, I mean, in theory, you could write that all just out in math and like, okay, here's the math of all the individual components, um, in my theory. Um, but then you just have pages and pages of math and you're like, I have no idea what predictions are going to come out of this theory. So what you need to do is you need to take all this math, you need to shove it into a computer simulation, run the computer simulation. Um, and then that will show you, well, what is the behavior that this theory predicts? Um, basically, this is just what's going to happen if you have a complicated theory. Um, it's not going to be analytically tractable. You have to run the simulation to find out what's going to go on. Cool. Um, so with that sort of approach, um, this sort of ends up being sort of categorized as, sort of, as cognitive modeling. Um, and there's a lot of there's a big lots and lots of people do this. Um, you choose some sort of phenomenon. You go and examine the human behavior. You have some ideas about what what you think could be underlying that human behavior. You build a computer program out of those ideas. 
you go ahead and compare the behaviors of the program to humans. Um, and this sort of approach has been used in many, many, many domains. Um, you know, this is great models of, of memory, of mental arithmetic, reward learning, just any domain of psychology, of, of human behavior. Um, people have come up with cognitive models uh, for that. And of course, the common problem in all of this is, well, how in the world do we know if we're right? Uh, just because I've made a computer program that happens to produce the same data as the humans, so what? Um, there's a lot of things you can play with in a computer program in order to, you know, you can make a lot of any output you want because you're programming. How do we know if we're right? One approach uh, to dealing with that problem is to say, look, we're going to put some constraints on this. Um, we're, go you know, it's not like every single time someone does a new task, they just get a totally new brain to do it. Um, it's the same brain being used to do many, many different tasks. And so in theory, we should be able to start identifying sort of basic components of these um, cognitive models that keep appearing in lots and lots and lots of different uh, tasks um, and start saying, hey, look, these are the basic components. Um, when you want to make a new model of a new task, um, you use these basic, same basic components. Um, and um, they make it used in different ways, but this starts adding a lot of constraints into your theory. You start saying, oh, hey, look, in these tasks, this particular, you know, this particular module has this sort of level of accuracy, therefore it should have the same accuracy in these other tasks, or it should be, you know, the model should have the same capabilities in these other tasks. Um, you start getting all of these subcomponents that you can start building things up out of. Um, that sort of terminology is called cognitive architectures, and you start going into that into that direction. Um, and again, that's really the, the main sorts of things that I focused on um, in my PhD, um, was focusing on these cognitive architectures, and in particular, one cognitive architecture, ACT-R, um, which is argued which is definitely, or I would say would be sort of the gold standard of this sort of approach um, in that there's a core set of modules that are used by a wide variety of researchers. There's probably on the order of 100 to 200 researchers around the world who are actively using or actively publishing ACTAR models. Um, um, and so there's these, this common set of components um, in contrast to a lot of other cognitive architectures where it's sort of you know, the professor who came up with the cognitive architecture and their students are pretty much the only people who use it. Um, I mean, ACTAR started that way, but it's had enough of a history and enough of a spread that um, the, there's a lot of people around the world using it. And it's been used for many, many, many different tasks. Um, and it's got these sorts of components of like, okay, here's a declarative memory component. And it sort of says, okay, well, this is exactly how, whenever you see a new idea, here's how quickly that memory, or how, when you when you create a new memory, here's how quickly that memory decays away. Um, that's the equation you're seeing at the top right there. Um, it's been, you know, validated in lots and lots and lots of different tasks. Um, the... Um, Procedural memory, so, so, so there's these declarative memory modules, there's these procedural memory modules, which have sort of, here's a, you know, when you're doing, actually doing a task, you break the task down into a whole bunch of if-then rules, um, and they're sort of like really, really, really simple if-then rules. Like if I'm in the middle of counting and I'm currently at the number of three, then I should go to the number four next. Like, it's a really simple, like, low-level rule. Um, and across all of these different tasks, you start getting these neat things where like, oh, okay, that equation in the top right of how quickly memory decays, it looks like across tons of tasks and tons of people in lots of different situations, um, the parameter D in that equation um, is pretty much always 0.5. That's the, you know, that is what fits the human data the best. Um, those if-then rules that I just commented just looks across tons of tasks. It looks like it takes about 50 milliseconds for, um, or, or if you were trying to match human data, if you set uh, 50 milliseconds to be how long it takes to do those, then that's where you get the best match to human data. Um, so cool, like, like that really seems like we're making progress. Like there's something fundamentally true right about these things. Um, the fact that they work in many, many different tasks, that, that got me really excited. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at these sorts of things and looking at questions like, well, what are the limits on these procedural rules? What things can you put in the if-then rules? Um, all sorts of interesting theory 
stuff you can do in there. Um, and it's, as I said, it's been applied to many, many different tasks, mental arithmetic, air traffic control, driving a car, dialing a phone. Importantly, also things like, well, if you have a model of how people drive a car all broken down in these components, and then you also have a model of how people dial a phone number, um, it then turns out that you try running both of those models at the same time, and it makes exactly the same sorts of mistakes that people make when they're trying to drive a car and dial a phone number. Um, and so that's and it really strong indication that that there's this sort of approach is on is on a nice is on the right track. Um, so bringing in these cognitive architectures um, adds a lot more constraints onto your theory because you have to build things out of the same components that were useful in other tasks. Um, the, it means that you can, whatever parameter values work in one task, um, shouldn't change much in other tasks, um, or you have to end up having some sort of theory, but, oh, okay, when people are under like a lot of time pressure, then you change the parameters one way. And if they're, if they are sort of a little bit more relaxed, you can change the parameters another way. Um, um, Overall, what we're doing here is we're predicting many different aspects of behavior with a small set of components. Um, and that's sort of a, um, a powerful statement about maybe we're on the right track. But you will notice that in everything I just described there, and everything I just described there was basically what I did during my PhD time, um, I'm deeply interested in the, you know, the algorithms underlying cognition. That's what I'm studying. I didn't say anything at all about the brain, just nothing. I, the brain just didn't come up. Indeed, in my coursework uh, for my PhD, I think I took one course on, on neuroscience. Um, I mean, the brain gets mentioned in psychology courses and you map things onto particular brain areas, um, but really didn't pay much close attention to it. Um, and that was a that's a, a really common point of view for people making these cognitive architectures. Um, and, and the argument goes something like this. Um, look, if we're interested in algorithms, if we're interested in the algorithms underlying cognition, well, let's just focus on the algorithms. Why not, like, like, don't also add on this extra task of, oh, not only find the algorithm, but also, you know, also figure out exactly how that algorithm happens to get implemented in, in biological neurons. You know, why put that extra constraint on ourselves if all we're doing is looking for the best algorithm um, to explain cognition? Um, and that was sort of compelling to me for a long time, but it, I had this sort of worry in the back of my head about what the heck's going on there. Um, um, and the, um, so I, yeah, I had this worry in the back of my head about what's going on there. Um, and so the main thing I want, but I basically, I changed my mind. <laughs> um, and my hope throughout this series of lectures, um, is that I, you know, can also change your mind a little bit. I'm, I don't want to say that everyone should pay attention to the brain, um, but I do think there's some situations where it is going to make sense to pay attention to the brain. And I think there's two big reasons for doing that. Um, one of them sort of a little bit more commonly talked about. Um, one is that if you pay attention to the brain, you get even more predictions out of your theory. Um, I'd indicated before that one of the neat things with these cognitive architectures is you're getting lots of predictions out of you know, a very um, a small set of components. Um, if you're also able to make biology predictions as well, it's not just behavioral predictions, you're also able to say things like, oh, and I think there should be this sort of connectivity between these brain areas, or I should see these sorts of firing patterns, or if I damage this particular brain area, um, then this is what should happen. Um, or if I, you know, give the brain simulation cocaine, then this is how it's going to change its behavior. Um, so there's a whole bunch of new types of predictions that if you do tie your model to biology, um, um, you've got this, this new, more ways of testing it. Um, so that's one big reason that people talk about. It's not, I don't actually think this is the more important, most important reason. Um, it's great. It's really good to be able to do that. There's a, I think there's a more fundamental reason. Um, and it's the one that caused me to sort of drop everything and learn this new approach. Um, and that is that, look, if I'm interested in the algorithms underlying cognition, if I'm interested in understanding how cognition works, 
there's an infinite number of algorithms to, that, that I could possibly come up with. If I'm, if I'm trying to figure out what the best algorithm is, uh, like there's just so many possible algorithms. And also, but if I know I'm going to go make a computational simulation of those algorithms, if I know I'm going to take my theory, whatever theory I come up with, I'm going to put it into a computer program or run that computer program. I think there's an unconscious bias that's sneaking in here. I think I'm that in that situation, I'm going to be more prone to think about algorithms that are easy for me to implement um, in a traditional um, computer programming situation. Um, and there is no reason whatsoever to believe that the algorithms underlying cognition are the same as the algorithms that are easy to implement in traditional programming languages. Um, th those are wildly different um, or potentially wildly different things. And what I would really like to do then to tie this to biology is, well, if we could identify what are the types of algorithms that neurons are good at implementing, then we might be able, then, then that gives us a whole new set, you know, then a new set of theories where we can say, okay, look, if I'm coming up with a new algorithm, I should consider these types of algorithms, you know, this is the type, class of algorithms I should consider. Um, and since I'm going to go ahead and implement these things in a computer program anyway, um, we should also, you know, develop new software tools um, that are going to make those types of algorithms easy um, to program. So that's where I'm coming from. This is what caused me to sort of drop everything that I was doing and go switch my research. Um, actually, well, what happened is I read one of uh, Chris Eliasmus' early papers, um, the head of the lab that I'm currently in, or I was in, um, and I read one of his early papers and it sort of laid out the ground. This is like a 2005 cognitive science conf conference paper. Um, and it laid out the groundwork for basically everything that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, and so I was just finishing my PhD at that point. I finished that off, moved to Waterloo, and just started showing up in his lab because I just really wanted to work on this stuff. And, and so I just kept showing up in his lab, and eventually he said, all right, fine, I'll pay you, and you can, you can be a postdoc with me. Um, so I feel also very lucky that that happened. Um, anyway, so... I think this is really neat because I didn't even think this sort of thing would be possible. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I did not think it would be possible to be able to make strong statements about, well, what are neurons good at implementing? Um, and I think this gives a very different insight um, into the sorts of algorithms we should consider. Cool. Okay. Um, where are we going to go with that? So the idea of algorithm, you know, neurons implementing algorithms is not new. Okay, um, so connectionism exists, has existed for a long time. Neural networks are a thing. They've kind of taken over, like, all of AI. Um, uh, you know, this basic idea of, hey, I have a neural network. It's made, it has components. They're called neurons. It has many of them. There's connections between these components. Um, there's some sort of, you know, you know, you take all their inputs, you add them all up, do some nonlinearity, produce outputs. This idea is pretty standard. Um, that's fine. Um, there's lots of people that do this. Um, and there's all sorts of questions about, okay, well, what components are we going to be use? Are we going to use, um, you know, what, what, what sort of neuron model are we going to use? Um, standard thing used to be to choose sigmoid neurons because that was easy to program. Um, Turns out rectified linear units are now what everyone uses because they're even easier to program. Um, but then when any of these sorts of large scale connectionist type models, you always get this question of, well, where do we get these connection weights from? Because there's just so many of them. Um, right? If I have, I have a thousand neurons connected to another thousand neurons, there's a million connection weights. I have to get those million connection weights somewhere. Um, and often the approach is you start with some random connection weights and you apply some learning rule um, and things get better at the task, maybe um, and lots and lots and lots of compute time is needed to do all that. Um, that's sort of the standard connectionist approach. Um, the, the work from Chris Eliasmith that is sort of the foundation of everything in this course um, says, hey, is there another way? Um, so this is the book uh, that lays all of this out, uh, Neural Engineering. Um, and, um, 
the core idea here is just trying to figure out exactly the, the question I was saying is, well, what are realistic neurons good at computing? What sorts of algorithms can they implement? Um, and can this help resolve the connection weight problem? Does it then it's going to turn out that this is going to give us a very different way of generating those connection weights. Um, this is the book. Um, I would highly recommend that no one read this book. It's, it's like, yeah, it's it's not the most accessible of books. Um, there's, um, you know, if you if you have a, you know, an engineering degree and a neuroscience degree, and a physics degree, and maybe a couple other degrees, great, cool, fine. Um, it's 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 um, it does lay everything out. It is fascinating. Um, there's another book that we'll mention later in in the courses that sort of gives things in a little bit more accessible uh, manner. But this is where it all came from. Um, all right, um, and so what exactly did, does that um, book lay out? First of all, what do we mean by a neuron? Um, well, what's a neuron really like? I've, we've shown this particular picture here, you know, circles with little connections between them. Sometimes you get pictures more like what's there on the right of, uh, you know, oh yeah, there's things that are a little bit more complex, but there's all these neurons, they've got these connections. Um, you Maybe you'll get pictures like this, where there is some sort of cell body, this is the sort of the, the soma of the neuron, the body of the neuron, all these sorts of dendrites produce, you know, this is where we gather all of our input charge, the charge builds up in the cell body, eventually the cell body, the voltage reaches some threshold, and that produces a spike, which travels down this axon goes out the synaptic terminals and into the dendrites of the next neuron and so on. So you get nice pretty pictures like that. Um, this is what a neuron's actually like. Oops, let's uh, kill the audio of that. There we are. So um, this is a neuron. So this is what a neuron actually looks like. Um, there we've like spread everything out just in order to show lots of all the internal space. Um, what we've, what that video is actually doing is, all right, so that's a human hair at the top. Um, we're sort of zooming in on a particular area. Um, what they've done is they've sort of flash frozen a mouse brain, rat brain, something like that, uh, one of those, um, taken lots and lots and lots of slices of those. Um, you take all these slices, um, that's what they look like under the uh, microscope. Um, you then hire some poor grad student who has to go in and circle and color in each of these sorts of areas. Um, eventually, you start automating that process and machine learning starts doing it. Um, and what you end up with is this sort of incredibly packed together picture. Um, and so that, all of that work that was just shown there is sort of a zoom in of that one particular tiny piece of the axon of one neuron. Um, and everything is just packed together really, really, really quite tightly there. There are something like 200 other neurons that are going, all those different colors are different other neurons that are sort of crossing through in this. There's none of this big, giant, empty space, basically. Um, it's a big mess, right? Neurons are incredibly complicated. They're not just a sigmoid or a rectified linear operation. That's the point I wanted to make there. So, um, there are neurons. Um, they, so neurons are these ridiculously complicated things. We can simulate them very well. Like there are really, really, really good simulations of neurons that seem to match you know, you take one particular neuron out of the brain, you go ahead and, you know, measure a whole bunch of things about it, about its, you know, membrane resistance and size, and um, and you can get, you can use a full supercomputer that will just, and do a really good job of simulating one individual neuron. Um, we pretty much know a lot of what the heck they're doing. Um, of course, one neuron on its own isn't all that useful, but you can run, you know, if you have really, really, really big computers, you can have lots of these neurons, and you can simulate a lot of them. Um, that is possible. Um, the, if people are interested in those sorts of directions, the Henry Markram paper, um, Cell 2015, 
Um, really nice simulation, 31,000 neurons, 37 million synapses. Randomly connected um, and doesn't actually produce any behavior, but the individual simulation matches individual neurons incredibly well. Um, so we can put in all of that sort of detail if we want. The main question, of course, then becomes, well, do we need all that complexity? How do we how, how do we know when to stop with this process? Like, you know, would half of that complexity be enough? A third? I have no idea. Do we need more complexity? Um, how do we know when to stop? Um, and this is sort of this is a fundamental sort of philosophy of science sorts of question, um, because any science with you know dealing with modeling reality, um, there's you know levels of abstraction you need to deal with, um, like the you know, um, even in, so in physics, gravity, some, sometimes Newton's gravity equations are all that you need. Um, sometimes you need to be able to, you know, go up to, um, uh, more complex gravity models. Um, and I think that's exactly the approach we want to take here, that the level of detail needs to depend on the question being asked. If I'm doing a model that, or if I'm doing a, um, you know, testing a theory and saying, oh, hey, look, um, I want to know how the presence of um, a certain sort of drug uh, is going to modify the behavior um, of this uh, uh, in this task, well, then I'm going to need to know how that drug affects neurons in the brain, and so I'm going to re require a detailed enough model of the neuron that the drug that we know how the drug you know would modify that neuron. Um, so sometimes, so I certainly want to be able to go down to that level of detail when needed. Um, I also want to know when it's safe for me not to go down to that level of detail, because I would like to be able to do things at big abstract levels. I don't want to have to use a full supercomputer to simulate every single individual neuron, because any sort of reasonable brain system is going to need millions of neurons, and I don't have a million supercomputers lying around. Um, so I want this to be sort of an adjustable level of detail. Um, what we're going to start with here um, is we're going to go with something fairly simple and uncontroversial, sort of the simplest model that at least still contains spikes in it, um, part, mostly because a lot of the data that we want to compare to, um, uh, we at least it's relatively common to get spiking neuron data um, from brains. Um, but importantly, everything we're going to talk about in this course, we could also apply to more complex neurons. All right, so what is one spiking? This is the, um, we're going to be using the, what's known as the leaky integrate and fire neuron model. Um, this is one spiking leaky integrate and fire neuron. Um, what we've got here is on the left, I've got this moving input that is sort of this sine wave going up and down that I'm feeding into my neuron. Um, on the right at the top, I've got this, this is sort of the voltage inside the neuron building up when the voltage hits the, the threshold, which is sort of at the top here, that's when the neuron emits a spike. Um, you'll also notice there's some random noise in there. Um, but when the voltage hits the top, that emits a spike. That's the, the generally considered output from a neuron. Um, at the bottom here, we're also going to be showing, um, Perhaps, a, you know, well, often, we often think of spikes as the outputs of neurons. Technically, what a spike does is a spike force causes neurotransmitter to be released, and it's the neurotransmitter that affects the current flowing into the next neuron. Um, and that's a more continuous process, because that's the neuro neurotransmitter gets released by the spike and then gradually reabsorbed. Um, so in some senses, we could think of this bottom thing as the actual output from the neuron. It's... Um, uh, yeah, there's it's, it's how much influence is this neuron currently having on the next neuron? Okay, um, and um, and so and then one other th so in, in a way of summarizing that you can see as the the input goes up and down when it's when the input is is high we get a lot of spikes when the input is low we get no spikes. Um, one way to summarize that is this graph over here, um, the top left. Um, this is sometimes called a tuning curve plot, um, where on the x-axis we have, um, well, what's the input right now? Um, and on the y-axis, whoops, yeah, yeah. and on the y-axis is, um, if we'd kept the input at this rate for a long period of time, what's the average fire, 
number of spikes per second that we would get. This is sort of a firing rate. So if I held the input constant at some value, oh, I would get something like, you know, this here would be something like 60 hertz or 70 hertz um, of firing. So it's a relatively typical sort of plot that, uh, um, that you might get from a neuroscientist. Um, so this is our basic idea of a neuron. Okay, I've got some input, it does some spiking. This is the basic component that I want to build up all of my algorithms that I'm going to use for cognition. Um, I'm going to build them up out of this component. If I take this component and I hand it to an engineer, yeah, they're just going to laugh at me. I mean, th this is a horrible, horrible, horrible component. If I was, it's just, if I would just want to build things out of them, right? I mean, given that input, given that sliding input, like in that output, I, I'm not even sure I could figure out a way to like, you know, given the output of the system, what was the input? Like, I, if it can't even pass in from, you know, it can't even just like even just represent its own input. How in the world am I going to build anything out of this system? Um, it's just, it just looks like a useless component. Um, and I can totally understand why lots and lots of cognitive modelers just simply say, look, I don't care how my algorithms get implemented using a bizarre component like this. Um, I'm just going to ignore the implementation. Fortunately, there's more than one neuron in the brain. So what happens? We do the same thing with two neurons. And in particular, I want two neurons that respond to the, to, the, um, to whatever this external stimuli is that's moving up and down. Um, I, I want them to respond differently. Um, this is something you find in biology a lot. Um, and, um, and, and what we've got here um, is we've got one where one of the neurons responds to positive inputs, one of the neurons responds more to negative inputs. So the blue one is responding to positive, and the red one is responding more to negative inputs. Um, so an example might be uh, the neurons that detect the tilt of your head left or right. So this would be saying if I tilt my head all the way to the left, uh, the blue neuron is firing a lot. If I tilt my head all the way to the right, the red neuron would be firing a lot. Um, if I keep my head in the middle, then both the neurons are firing a little bit. Okay, so that's sort of a pretty typical thing to find. Um, this middle column is the same thing as before. It's voltage building up, spikes being produced, neurotransmitter being output. And now what do I want to do with these things? Well, one thing I could do is I could take the blue line and just keep it how it is. I could take the red line... I'm going to flip it upside down. So you're just going to multiply it by minus one. And then I'm going to take these two things and I'm going to add them together. And I'm going to get this black line up here. Um, and if I look really closely and kind of squint, this black line that I've built up out of a weighted sum of the outputs of the two neurons, right? I weighted one of them by multiplying it by one, the other one I multiplied by minus one, and then I added them together. So it's a weighted sum. Um, this black line looks kind of maybe like the input. Maybe? No? Not really convincing? Let's go to four neurons. Um, four neurons, and they're not identical neurons. So you'll notice these neurons have different tuning curves. All right, these neurons respond to their inputs differently. Um, that actually ends up being important for what we're, what we're doing here. Um, we get our spikes, we get our weights. Or we, we get our outputs. And now, in order to make this black line, I'm still doing a weighted sum, but I've got four things. Um, but there is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, what weight should I apply to each of these, um, the, the two blues and the two red lines? Um, and you can express that as, well, um, you know, what would be the weights that I should put on here? that would make this black output line as close as possible to the original input. All right. That's just a least squared minimization problem. Right? That's just a fitting problem. That's a regression problem. Um, you take this data here in, in this box here. Um, you call that, that's a big giant matrix. Um, you, you know, and, and you're trying to solve for, if you call this A, um, and you call, you know, and then and you had some weights here, so if you take this matrix and you multiply it by some vector um, and you want it to be equal to this vector here, right? This is first year linear algebra. Um, you take a matrix, you invert it, and that gives you the best weights um, 
uh, that will that will give you these this output. Looks a little bit better. It does an okay job of this task, sort of maybe. Let's show that again, right? With four neurons, we're getting something that looks kind of vaguely like a sine wave. You still got to squint at it a little bit. But that technique I just described, let's do it with 50 neurons. 50 neurons, and now I can recover that input fine. Okay, it, you do in order for this to work, you do need neurons of different with different properties, as we're seeing here, and as we do see in the in the real brain. Um, and not only that, but you could do this technique for. It doesn't have to just solve for find me the weights that will give you the output that's the same as the input. You could also solve for weights that would give an output that is some function of the input. Right? There's no special constraint here. All, and all we're doing is we're finding, well, what weighted sum of the outputs of these neurons is best for whatever task that I want. Okay, so that's giving us our, sort of our first step in the direction of building algorithms out of neurons. Another way to describe what I just said there is the traditional statement that, look, what are neural networks good at? Neural networks are good at function approximation. Okay, so I'm just going to show exactly what I just described there in, in more general um, and in sort of a traditional neural network approach. Um, we've got some sort of input. That's called x in this case. In the graphs I was just showing, x was one-dimensional, but in general, x can be multi-dimensional. I've got my, some neurons. That's in my sort of this middle layer here. Um, these... This encoder, the connection weights that we're seeing on the encoder, um, those in the previous graphs are just being randomly assigned. That's what gave each of these neurons a different tuning curve. Um, and you can randomly assign those such that they give you tuning curves that look like what's in the brain. Um, or you can optimize them in lots of other ways. Um, but that's that's where that's where all the different neuron properties are coming from, or why why some neurons were more sensitive to positive numbers and some neurons were more sensitive to negative numbers. That's just the weights or just the signs on these weights. Um, and then on the right we have the decode. We have the second set of connection weights. That's the ones that we were solving for with that optimization process to say, hey, give me the outputs that do the best job of making um, this whole system um, approximate some function. All right. Uh, it was the identity function and the stuff that I was showing before, but in general it could be any function. Right. Um, and this is just a weird way of describing the standard story that neural network people have said for ages, which is, hey, look, neurons, groups of neurons in neural networks like this are good at function approximation. Um, and yay, it also happens to apply to spiking neurons as well. That's not a big surprise. Um, all right. So what are we doing with this? Well. Our first assumption that we're making that we got to be really explicit about is that, look, the neural activity is doing some sort of distributed representation of some vector. So there is some underlying thing being represented, um, you know, whether it was head location and the or, you know, tilt of your head in the video that I was uh, showing a moment ago, or some other thing, some other value X that is being encoded in a distributed manner across these neurons. So there's redundancy in these neurons. It's not like each individual neuron is representing something different. Um, uh, these neurons are, as a group, doing some sort of distributed representation. Um, and we're going to make the assumption that, hey, look, connections coming out of neurons are decoding functions of x. Okay. So that's not too controversial. It's a little bit of a, it's a weird way of presenting things, um, but it's, those are not particularly controversial statements. Um, but it's gonna; those are going to be the foundation of of where we're going to go with this. Okay. But I want to I want us to because this is going to be so important. I want us to get a little bit of a feel um, for um, yeah for where we're going to go with that. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do now is start doing a little bit of hands-on aspect of this course. So. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I want to be able to make software that um, that helps us make these sorts of algorithms. We have such software. There's a software called Nengo. Um, it is free for non-commercial use. Um, so it's all on GitHub. Um, source, code is for, source code is freely available. Um, it's a Python program. Um, the only requirements are Python and NumPy. Um, if you're used to Python, great, cool, 
um, then all you have to do is type pip install Nengo and pip install Nengo GUI, and you will you will have that. Um, if you if you are not familiar with Python, um, this course is still meant to be something you can follow along with and do some initial programming. The reason we chose Python is it's relatively accessible to um, to you know newcomers who have never seen the language before. So hopefully um, it'll still make sense what's happening. Um, if you do not have Python currently on your computer and you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend the way to install it is uh, download something called Anaconda, um, which is Python with all the extras already installed and built in. Um, and so uh, if you go ahead and install Anaconda um, and then go to the Anaconda command prompt and give these commands pip install Nengo, pip install Nengo GUI, what those will do is go ahead and download Nengo, which is the core simulator, and Nengo GUI, which is the graphical interface we'll be using in the course. Um, and then once you've done that, you can run it by again going to the Anaconda command prompt and typing Nengo. Okay. We will see that uh, in a moment. Okay. 